Good morning, everyone, Your Majesty, dear friends. Like Anna Boy pointed out, I think there's a lot of scientific support, in fact, overwhelming scientific support, that we will, in fact, be looking back at 2015 at a moment when the world, you know, like in Swedish, we say, Poletten <laughs> trillade ner, meaning that scientifically, the world of leadership, business, political leadership understood finally that we're tipping towards a new logic, we're tipping over towards sustainability, being not only the pathway necessary to avoid catastrophic outcomes, but also the most desirable and attractive pathway to be able to take a step towards even improved human prosperity on planet Earth. And what I will be doing here, which I realize is, as, as you point out, quite unnecessary, is just to give you kind of a bit of the scientific update of the justification behind and how this connects to the fantastic work done by the natural step in terms of the framework for strategic sustainable development and how to operationalize the enormous insights we culminate in 2015. Now, of course, there's absolutely no surprise to you at all that we now know with empirical evidence that is established by scientific observation across the world that 2015 is the world's warmest year on record and that we are following very you know, clearly the scientific analysis of how anthropogenic global environmental change affects the stability of energy on the planet and how it is now leading to a remarkable and very worrying temperature rise. As you know, 2015 is the first year we record us having met or reached one degree Celsius warming compared to the pre-industrial warming. And this is a number I'll be coming back to because one degree Celsius also happens to be the ceiling within which we have been operating since the last ice age. So if we have our sweet spot of potential for modern civilizational development on planet Earth, we have in 2015 hit the ceiling of that corridor of safety. The second, of course, is the reminder that planet Earth is a complex, resilient, and interdependent system where every component interacts and plays in our favor. In fact, there is no stable planet only by reducing emission of greenhouse gases. The only way we can now meet the remarkable I will really emphasize remarkable step forward in terms of the political leadership adopting the Paris Climate Agreement, which no longer, as you all know, is about coming down to 2 degrees Celsius warming as compared to the pre-industrial level, but actually aiming for 1.5 degrees Celsius. I can assure you that there's not one scientific scenario, not one, that can come close to 1 degree, 1.5 degrees Celsius without combining decarbonization of fossil fuel emissions and sustainable management of the biosphere and reducing all the other polluting short-lived climate forces, black carbon, soot, etc. So there's no other pathway since Paris than a transformation to full sustainability. Now this graph just reminds us a little bit about that, which is we tend to focus all our climate focus on temperature in the atmosphere. Well, in fact, over 90% of the heat is taken up by the oceans and it's been plowed down deep in the ocean, which has lulled us into a comfort zone. We scientists tend to call this Earth resilience. Earth has this remarkable capacity to buffer stress and shocks, meaning sucking up energy imbalance caused by us humans. Now this is true. It is resilience. It is this remarkable strength of your system. But remember, it's also about shoving abuse under the carpet. It's about hiding debt that we have and subsidy that we have allowed ourselves for our own short-term GDP-based consumer economic development. And now we're starting to see how this heat is also coming back in terms of surprise and shocks. The El Nino year 2015, the El Nino year 2015, is the most severe El Nino year we have on modern record. And we cannot exclude any longer that this natural variability in El Nino, which is heat rising in the Pacific Ocean, leading to the remarkable variability, natural, yes, but strengthened in certainty by the heat rising in the oceans, which cannot be decoupled from this loading of heat that we have caused over the last 150 years, which causes the remarkable floods in East Africa, the enormous drought in Central America, and the very, very sharp and, and unpredicted shifts in terms of floods, droughts, and even winter conditions in some parts of the Northern Hemisphere. So the in, in integrated systems approach to sustainability is absolutely necessary. 
We also know from the great insights of 30 years of science that we are now in the great uh, acceleration of human pressures on the planet. This graph is not meant for you to be able to see each parameter, but it shows basically from every parameter that matters for economic growth and human well-being that we have an exponential rise. You see the pattern from industrial revolution until today of exponential rise of pressures on the planet. In simple, we now have evidence from any parameter you may choose, from biodiversity to emission of greenhouse gases, the same exponential rise, we're hitting the ceiling of the biophysical capacity of planet Earth to remain in its stable, resilient state and to deliver and deliver prosperity for human well-being. This, as you know, is so severe that science, in just a month or two, will be deciding whether we now shift once and for all our definition, our current era, from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. Anthropocene being, us humans, the main driver of change on planet Earth. So, I will argue, welcome to the Anthropocene, and scientific evidence we have. We have, therefore, as you may also have followed in terms of the scientific advancement, reached a very important decisive uh, shift in terms of our relationship to planet Earth. You know, so we entered the Anthropocene and the Great Acceleration in the 1950s. That's when the exponential rise of unsustainable pressures started. But you see, the first decades after the Great Acceleration started, planet Earth had ample redundant atmosphere to absorb our emission of greenhouse gases. It had ample fish in the Baltic Sea. It had ample ability to absorb nitrogen and phosphorus in lake systems across the US. It had ample rainforest to take cutting down without having collapse. It even had ample fish stocks in the oceans to be able to just go to the next virgin area to pioneer exploitation. We had rare earth metals, we could expand agriculture. In fact, up until 1990, you know, this is a very cynical, pragmatic argument, I agree. I'm not defending those who never, ever took environment seriously. But up until 1990, you can almost excuse those who believed that it actually worked. That, you know, we could deliver incredible wealth and human well-being and GDP growth at the expense of the planet, which was clearly relatively large compared to our relatively small world, and it really worked. And it, of course, delivered equity-wide in a bit of a dilemma to the rich minority on the planet predominantly, but it did deliver more food, more wealth, more health to more people than ever before. But since 1990, I can reassure you that if you scan off the science, we have changed the logic. We have become a relatively large world on a small planet. We've saturated the entire resource, ecosystem and climate space on planet Earth. And it's therefore no surprise that science is now starting to see invoices coming back from the Earth system with tipping points occurring. Accelerated melting in the Arctic sea ice. Sudden loss of the Thwaites Glacier and the Ammon Sea in Antarctica. Sudden collapse of cod fisheries out of Newfoundland. The dilemma of a tipping point even in the Baltic Sea in terms of anoxia etc, etc. So this is the change, and this happened 25 years ago, as, as Cal and others are so well aware. But it has taken us up until 2015 for Poletten at Filanir. <laughs> and this is a classic, as you all know. The UN has done many studies showing that it takes roughly 25 years before the early warning really gets settled in into understanding. But I think there's a lot of signals to suggest that now is the time that this has occurred. The drama is that you know, this costs us already impacts. And I will go very quickly over this. You know, we, we start seeing the first dramatic scientific evidence that you cannot explain even the, you know, very dramatic social, political, abrupt changes, and for example, the insurgents in Syria, to decouple it from global environmental change in the Anthropocene. We have facts today of the four worst recorded drought years ever in Syria ever meaning potentially even back to 8,000 years ago, and this is important because Syria is part of the Mesopotamian region where agriculture was invented from its origins, and that during these four years, over one million farmers had to leave forcefully rural regions into Aleppo, Damascus, and other regions, even Assad issuing warnings of uncertainty, what this destabilization would mean, and that we can no longer decouple this ecological change from the social, political, drama we're seeing today. Similarly goes for the Arab Spring, where we see these kind of indications. The first time we're starting to see that in a loaded Anthropocene world, we start seeing social environmental changes occurring at the large scale. We have a lot of evidence showing that palm oil expansion in Borneo, 
makes rainforests more sensitive, coupled with small-scale farming, increasing burning of forest, leading to uncontrolled forest fires, causing smog shocks in Southeast Asia just a few months back, affecting health in Singapore, which estimates now shows released over 600 million tons of carbon dioxide, equivalent of what Germany burns from fossil fuels over one year, leading to this kind of turbulent impacts and feedbacks, which we now increasingly need to be used to in the Anthropocene. So this is the turbulent situation we're in, which leads to the conclusion that we have to address what we call Earth resilience, the capacity of us to be stewards of a planet that stays stable and avoid that any component of the Earth system, from ecosystems to the atmosphere, kind of moves away from a sustainable state. And this is, of course, no surprise to, to this audience that we need to consider, even as a finance minister in Sweden, the equal you know, engagement in our local economy and our local environment as maintaining the Svalbard and the whole Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets in a permanent state. Why? Because these regulate the stability of the climate on the planet. These are cooling systems that reflect back some 80-90% of incoming heat from the sun back to space. We need these systems intact. We cannot allow them to start melting rapidly, which leads to dramatic effects, of course, for local communities and species, but also to a change in color. And that darkening in the color is now shown very clearly by science, has dramatic effects over the entire planetary climate system. You've probably seen this data from NASA, which shows just from satellite the amount of heat reflected back to space from Greenland. And the drama here is, is shown very pedagogically. Here you have days of the year, so January until December. In color you see what we want in a stable planet, which is basically 80-90% of incoming heat reflected back to space. It goes down a little bit to 75-80% during summer because naturally there's always a fringe of Greenland that is a little bit melting on the surface. But look at the year 2012, and here's 2015, which shows a change. And the change is that we're starting to observe for the first time ever that the entire Greenland ice sheet is melting. Not that it's melting, that it's disappearing, but it's melting on the surface, just making it slightly darker, which means that suddenly Greenland tips over from being an absorber to being a net releaser of heat into the atmosphere. So instead of bouncing back and functioning as a mirror, cooling the planet, it warms the planet. We see similar data, as I mentioned earlier, in Antarctica, with the Thwaites Glacier now irreversibly gliding into the ocean. A surprise to science, because it's always been thought that Antarctica is more resilient. This can only be explained by, again, the heat in the ocean coming up, upwelling, and lubricating the big glaciers from below. And I can tell you that the nightmare here is the following, that the Thwaites Glacier appears to be like a, like a block in a bottle, that when you lose this plug, you might be losing the firm position of upstream glaciers that might simply start irreversibly gliding down. Estimates indicating that this change of parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet may commit us to another one meter sea level rise. Again, it's resilience at play. And you may have seen this paper that came out just before COP21 showing that if we burn up all the fossil fuel reserves we have, if we simply take everything that is now valued on the stock market as the resource for our oil, coal, and natural gas companies, we're in for another 58 meter sea level rise. Five, <sighs> eight. So these are massive, massive transformative changes which are also integrated, interesting enough, in the financial system in terms of valuing today. You may be aware that last time we had over one degree Celsius warming, we had an average sea level rise of six meters higher than today. So when we exceed even one degree Celsius, we're in for very large changes. So the question is, are we leaving Eden's garden? Are we leaving the stable state of the planet? And science can today give a very firm answer to this, which is also one of the big, big step forward just over the past decade. And this comes from ice core data, as you may be aware. This happens to be from the northern hemisphere, but it would be looking alike from the southern hemisphere. It's days of the year. No, sorry, this is 100,000 years. It's a very pedagogic period for us because we've been modern humans as homo sapiens for roughly 100,000 years. So we've had the same capacity to develop civilizations as today. And here's a good proxy of how it was to live on Earth, namely variability of temperature. And as you already see from the graph, it was 
a jumpy ride indeed. We were hunters and gatherers during essentially this entire glacial period. We were a few million people. We had a very rough time. In fact, during some periods here, you had plus minus five degrees Celsius over a decade. And then we exit this ice age and we enter what we learned in school to call the Holocene. And just look at the graph, just a reminder of how remarkably, if not to say miraculously, stable the Holocene is. It's so stable, in fact, it keeps itself within plus minus one degree Celsius, despite all the variability we know so well about, you know, called Antillonde, who takes his army across Stura Belt in the 16th century to knock the Danes when we had the Little Ice Age, all the way to the Vikings growing, you know, growing vegetables and, and grape on Greenland during the little warm period in the 1100th uh, century. But it was all plus minus one degree Celsius. And we do what? We invent agriculture just when we enter the Holocene and take off in the model civilizations as we know it. So this is the reference point and the very, very important recognition that the planet plays a difference, that everything we have learned to recognize, to value, settles into the Holocene, be it the Rajampat coral reefs that today is part of a system giving livelihoods to two, three hundred million people, our own temperate forest in the northern hemispheres that regulates carbon sinks. We have the tropical rainforests, which are fundamental to the entire functioning of the Earth's system. Carbon sink, biodiversity, moisture regulation, rainfall. And again, the albedo systems in Antarctica and Arctic. And of course, the enormous valuable ecosystems that are so incredibly loved by so many communities and key for our own prosperity. So this is all the fundamental that settles into the Holocene. And again, just to check the data again, just look at the Holocene, how it remains in this plus minus one degree window, our own window of opportunity. Now, climate science has come a long way, and I would say that this graph is probably one of those that really informed the COP21, which is, here is the Holocene. So this is our, you know, our sweet spot for development. Here's the two degrees Celsius tipping point threshold that the climate agreement in the end finally agreed we need to stay under. Why? Because climate science is showing so clearly, as you see from this graph summary, that once we pass two degrees, we are in for not small changes, but abrupt tipping points that could move very large systems that regulate the planet from a desired to an undesired state, meaning that we could actually lose the Arctic summer ice, that the Greenland ice sheet is bound to be irreversibly moving towards a melting at three degrees Celsius, and so on and so forth. These are hardwired, non-negotiable, biophysical thresholds in the Earth system. We simply need to adapt to them and be very clever to navigate ourselves away from them. And of course, this means staying within a planetary boundary for climate, which should come as close as possible to the Holocene equilibrium. That's exactly what happened in Paris. So in summary, what this leads to is that inside of the Anthropocene, the insight that we cannot exclude tipping points, and the insight that the Holocene is our desired state, led to the planetary boundary framework, which, Anna, um, which was referred to earlier. And the planetary boundary framework is actually a guide of how we can define global sustainability at the planetary scale. It gives us a tool based on the best science defining what are the environmental processes that regulates our ability to stay on a stable, desirable, planet that can support humanity. And for each of these systems, can we define quantitatively a boundary giving us a operating space to allow ourselves to have good chances of development? And science can actually do this. And I won't go through this in detail. It's just to say that we've come so far that, in fact, defining planetary boundaries and defining it quantitatively as a safe operating space on a stable and resilient Earth system is scientifically today in the mainstream. And it has been scrutinized across the world. The drama is that this just gives us a first guide at the planetary scale. It doesn't give us an operational tool to move forward. It, just, it does change the way we look upon the whole planetary governance, though. As you may know, that last time we discussed sustainable development in 1992, we had these pillars, the Brundtland Commission pillars of ecological, human, and economic sustainable development. And we must simply admit that it never really worked. It became a, a Mickey Mouse type economy in the world with uh, the 
economic capital occurring at the expense of human and ecological capital, and that we need to transition into a new logic, a logic which is about an economy that, yes, can thrive, yes, can grow, yes, can develop, that delivers on societal aspirations, but occurs within a stable and really set playing field for humanity on a stable Earth system. And science can deliver on this. And the Sustainable Development Goals adopted last year is, in my mind, coming very close to this paradigm. The final recognition that the 17 goals has very high aspirations on social goals, eradicating hunger and poverty and having good lives, education, gender, etc., using economic development, but setting a climate, a biodiversity, a freshwater ocean goal, and the climate goal was reinforced, as we know, in Paris. So this is one step towards a global definition of what this is all about. And, and it lands in, in, a, in a mind shift of the great transformation, exactly in line with Anna Bori, you started off with, which is to you know, take our small, beautiful planet as the only chance we have to really have a prosperous future. But there is a big gap. And that is, I think, the gap for the dialogue today, which is that even if we can define scientifically a safe operating space at the planetary scale, even if we can define the large, so to say, framework on the planet, we still realize that we need to translate this operationally into a transformative process that gives us a transformation towards a world where we can all have good lives, good development for 9, 10 billion co-citizens on Earth. And that this is, as we all know, a transformation journey. It's no longer an incremental journey. It's a transformation, it's an innovation, it's a technology, it's an equity journey, which requires enormous ingenuity and efforts from local to global scales. And the drama is that we don't know really how to connect these two, you know, the grand insights. 2015 was a big, big breakthrough, but it's only a thought plan on paper. It's not an operational plan on the ground. And that's where my and many scientists' excitement comes up with the remarkable, fantastic work done by the framework on sustain the strategic framework on sustainable development that we'll be discussing here today and, and the progress made over the years on getting the sustainability principles operationalized at that level where it really means something to concrete business, communities, households, cities. And that now is the chance for the first time to connect the global with the whole FSSD framework and really translate that operationally so we can start this journey of grand transformation because we only have two, three decades on our timeline to transition into a safe operating space, giving us this good future without dramatic invoices. So I look forward to a very inspiring conversation today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Um, and uh, what have you seen? It's education and raised awareness, the, the first step, if we talk about what you see, the, the ignorance around the world when you meet. Is, is that always where to start? Mm. You know, a bit depressingly, perhaps, I would say the answer today is yes and no. I mean, education is always not only a worthwhile investment, but it's an urgent and necessary investment. In fact, we see an enormous need for education today to come out very rapidly to young, you know, young people mm -hmm. in, in, in basic school, but also at university level, and to start integrating environmental sustainability in, in economics and engineering in all different disciplines, absolutely. But, but at the same time, the mm -hmm. but is that, you know, we need to bend the curves of negative change over the next five years in order to avoid moving towards the kind of tipping points that we're seeing science increasing indicating. So I think that we need to somehow work on a double track where people like ourselves in this room need to start acting and acting with coalitions and alliances of, of willing corporations, organizations, individuals, while at the same time training the next generation. We cannot wait, you know, another generation. We cannot wait for the next generation of, of sustainability trained scholars. And I know that is something that you Khalid, well, have been, been emphasizing a lot that we need to also act um, decisively forward and, and have results quickly. And now is really the time to, to tip this over also at, in the business community and in the finance community to start showing at scale that investment sustainability is not a sacrifice. It's really where we can see the big value added and the benefits for humanity. And that has to be proved very soon. And, and how big is your confidence in the political leadership? 
Well, <laughs> <laughs> that was very revealing. I can tell your eyes. No, I, I, I must, I must admit that I'm, I'm very impressed. I mean, I've been among those for many years, openly frustrated with the lack of political leadership. As you may have heard, some of you have often likened uh, the situation in the world with uh, with a Tour de France cycling race, with the scientists having the yellow leadership shirt in the front, and the business leaders taking, you know, on, in Swedish, Gopurulle. You know, coming right behind scientists and really hanging in there and, and being really interested and, and starting to realize that this is serious. But the political leadership have lost Klungan long way back <laughs> and, and kind of really coming long after. But I think, I think uh, 2015 showed that uh, now science, business and policy have reached, you know, that we are in the front, the front gang cycling together for the first time in a long, long time. And and I think that is really genuine because remember that the COP21, the fear we all had was that it could fail because of financial crisis, terror crisis, uh, refugee crisis, and all the other you know, short-term dramatic issues that we we're facing. And, and the reality was completely the reverse. The, the, the realization that we need to take climate seriously was, if anything, even, even higher. So I think there is a genuine, genuine uh, commitment today in the political leadership. But isn't it that we still tend to dis uh, to expect this to be a bit linear, that we can decide, okay, now let's put uh, the bra turn the brakes on. Uh, we don't see the compound effects with the Gulf Stream or whatever. Mm. We, we, we expect the fever to be, to be manageable of the planet. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that comment so much because, if anything, that is probably the, the, the biggest, um, let's say, drama today in what has happened over the past few months because you know on the one hand the political leadership has agreed 1.5 to 2 degrees celsius it has taken the science seriously it has taken a big step forward but absolutely no signs of recognition that this is not business as usual this is i i would even dare use the word revolution because if we're going from a fossil fuel driven world economy to a decarbonized world economy by 2040. It is nothing less than, than an energy revolution. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be accomplished unless we have a food revolution. And we cannot mm -hmm. accomplish it unless we have a lifestyle revolution and business model changes. And the political leadership is not seeing that yet. It's as if we can accomplish this one, this one also through some kind of, you know, we tweak a little bit here and we mm -hmm. tweak a little bit there and we get some little environmental bonus here and some bonus malus there. And, and these are good things, but, but I think we need to start realizing this is, this is a grand, in Sweden, it's a grand Swedish project. We need to simply start locking ourselves to a complete shift in infrastructure, business, steel industry, aviation industry, and, and, and all, every sector needs to go through these large shifts. And, and that is a big, that has not really occurred yet. I don't think it's occurred among most, in fact, to be honest. Um, I, I think it's simply something we, we now need to come to recognition with, that this is a large system shift. And again, that's why I'm so excited about this day here, because it allows us to think in terms of how do you actually operationalize system change, not business as usual incremental change. So that's, that's exactly what I, I feel, at least, this is what we're talking about. And of course, that's what the natural step has always been going for, how to handle complex systems, yes. because very few have the total picture, mm. the big picture. So we are very grateful to have you to, to start this day. Thank you so much, Johan Rockström, and good Thank luck you very with much. all your work. Thank you very much.